This video was made possible by Tab for a Cause. Raise money for charity just by opening up new tabs, which you were going to do anyway. Link in the description. Several states have enacted major anti-abortion laws in the hope of overturning Roe versus Wade, which gives women a constitutional right to an abortion. What are all of these laws about? What does Roe actually say about the right to an abortion and the right to privacy? And where does Planned Parenthood versus Casey fit into this picture? In this real law review, I'm going to try to bring some clarity to this charged and fluid situation. To get there, I'm going to talk about the history of women's rights in America, discuss what has happened recently in Georgia, Alabama, and Missouri, and the laws that they passed, and explain what could be ahead for the Supreme Court. Hey Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer. Look, I know that this is a hot button issue. I have very strong personal beliefs about this and I'm sure you do too. I'm going to try to do my best to separate out my personal opinions because the law, whether you accept the outcome or not, is fairly cut and dry. As always, Stella appreciates and encourages a robust discussion, but Stella will bring down the band gavel on anyone that is rude or disrespectful in the comments. All right, but let's get straight to it. What is up with all of these new abortion laws that are cropping up, mainly in the American South? Well, right now, abortion is legal in all 50 states, but legislatures in Missouri, Mississippi, Ohio, Georgia, Alabama, Louisiana, and others are now racing to see who can pass the most draconian anti-abortion laws in America. But but there is method to this madness. Georgia, Mississippi, Ohio, and Alabama have enacted laws making it illegal to terminate a pregnancy once electrical activity in the fetal heart is detected. These are the so-called fetal heartbeat bills. Now, I recognize that this is a charged term, but it seems to be popularly adopted, so I'm going to use it in this particular video. Doctors say that this electrical activity can happen as early as six weeks after fertilization. Missouri passed a law criminalizing abortion starting at around eight weeks under this law doctors will get a prison sentence of three to five years, uh, but women will not be prosecuted. Georgia's law, which goes into effect January 1st, bans abortion once a heartbeat is detected. It allows for exceptions in the case of rape or incest, but only if the woman files a police report. Alabama's law contains no exception for pregnancies that were the result of rape or incest. Doctors performing abortions under this law face 99 years in prison. Pundits on both sides have recognized likely unintended consequences and nightmare scenarios. You can imagine the sad case of a teenage girl who becomes pregnant after she is raped by a father or uncle. In Georgia, that teen would need to figure out a way to report her father's crime to the police in order to have an abortion. If she had an abortion anyway, she could face life in prison. In Alabama, the doctor would also get life in jail. The new anti-abortion laws are intended to have a chilling effect on the rights of women, physicians, and others. As what tends to happen with the threat of criminal prosecution, undoubtedly, some women will be prevented from terminating their pregnancy. As we'll see, the timing of the bills and the burden placed on women is of great constitutional importance. The lawmakers who drafted these laws acknowledge that the laws uh, violate current Supreme Court precedent, but they decide decided to enact them specifically to test current Supreme Court precedent. If this law goes into effect in Alabama and it says uh, abortion's a crime, that is in conflict with Roe's interpretation and application of the U.S. Constitution, so the law is unconstitutional. Once it is passed, before it can go into effect, a lawsuit is expected to be filed. You're expecting to be sued? Of course. He passes a bill that he knows and they have intentionally designed to be unconstitutional. Right. And the Planned Parenthoods and the ACLUs of the world, they have to respond. This, of course, begs the very important question, how did we get here? Well, let's start with the very beginning of this country. After America gained its independence, the law largely remained silent about contraception and abortion. Abortion was legal from about 1776 until 1860. Of course, things started to change after the Civil War. This was the beginning of the Victorian era where preachers and politicians started arguing that sexual mores needed to become more restrictive. Birth control and abortion were both two of their targets, along with anything that implied sex might be a fun activity to engage in. Anti-sex crusaders really got going in the 1870s when the U.S. Postmaster General Anthony Comstock used the power of his office to enact laws that targeted anything considered obscene. 
Comstock thought the government had the power and the duty to restrict what you could send through the mail or say or read, especially when it came to sex and procreation. During Comstock's 42 years at the US Postal Service, he successfully advocated for laws that banned everything from masturbation to contraception. These Comstock laws, as they came to be known, were passed in the federal government and about half the states in America. Comstock laws made it a crime to give away, sell, or loan out any item considered, quote, obscene, or anything that could be used for contraception or abortion. Comstock laws made it illegal to use, quote, any drug, medicinal article, or instrument for the purpose of preventing conception. Violators could be, quote, fined not less than $50, or imprisoned not less than 60 days, nor more than one year, or both fined and imprisoned. Under Comstock laws, physicians were banned from even printing a pamphlet discussing family planning. As part of this anti-family planning regime, abortion became illegal in most states by the early 1920s. Now, of course, that didn't mean that there were no abortions performed, but they were often performed in secret, with wide disparities between those who could find a doctor to perform the procedure in secret and those who were left to try to perform the procedure themselves uh, without any access to medical treatment. In 1930 alone, it is reported that 2,700 women died in the United States from abortion-related procedures. While rarely enforced to the full extent possible, Comstock laws were still on the books until 1965, when the Supreme Court decided the landmark case of Griswold versus Connecticut. In 1961, Estelle Griswold was convicted for violating the Connecticut Comstock laws that prohibited anyone from providing contraception or information about contraception. Griswold used her medical clinic to provide birth control to her patients. William Buxton, a Yale Medical School professor, was also convicted for providing advice to married couples about how to avoid pregnancy. Their convictions were upheld on appeal and they took their case to the US Supreme Court. Now, some of you may be wondering how the government could interfere with a couple's private decision about contraceptives to begin with. Well, the Constitution enumerates individual rights through the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights protects things like freedom of speech, the right to due process under the law, and the right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures. The word privacy is not mentioned in the Bill of Rights or anywhere else in the Constitution. So in the mid 20th century, there had not been any significant case law allowing people personal freedom over their sexual lives. However, the Constitution does not define every freedom that it grants to the individual. It has been argued that privacy is implied in many of the other rights the Constitution does guarantee. The Fourth Amendment, for instance, gives you a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. That right is rooted in your right to privacy in your own home and body. In the 1920s, the Supreme Court interpreted the Constitution to expand individual rights. For example, in a case involving whether a teacher could teach children in the German language, the court ruled that the Due Process Clause protects protects a person's right to marry, have children, and to make decisions about that child's upbringing. Using these ideas, Griswold and Buxton framed their challenge to the Connecticut law as a broad question about privacy itself. The Supreme Court agreed, and the court found that the state law which banned distribution of contraceptives to be unconstitutional because it infringed on the general right of marital privacy that was implied in the Constitution. Although the court recognized that the right to privacy is not mentioned explicitly in the Constitution of the Bill of Rights, the Supreme Court said that you could infer it from the quote, penumbras and emanations of the Constitution. In other words, the shadows and intentions of the rights that are expressly laid out in the Bill of Rights. Justice William Douglas held that the privacy right emanated from the Bill of Rights. He cited the German language case as an example of how the First Amendment prevents the government from limiting the spectrum of available knowledge. And that same right also meant that Griswold and Buxton were able to share their contraceptive information with their patients. In addition, the Third Amendment's prohibition of forced quartering of troops, the Fourth Amendment's freedom from unreasonable searches and seizures, and the Fifth Amendment's right to avoid self-incrimination all describe different facets or quote, zones of privacy. Justice Goldberg's concurring opinion in Griswold also found a general right to privacy in the text of the Ninth Amendment, which states, quote, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. Many framers of the Constitution, though not all, believed it was impractical to list every freedom that should be protected by the Constitution itself. James Madison drafted the Ninth Amendment to create a safety net for liberties that are not enumerated in the Constitution expressly. 
And Justice Goldberg wrote that the, quote, framers of the Constitution believe that there are additional fundamental rights protected from governmental infringement, which exist alongside those fundamental rights specifically mentioned in the first eight constitutional amendments. On that basis, Goldberg concluded that the right to privacy is therefore one of the fundamental rights guaranteed, though not expressly mentioned in the Ninth Amendment. So at base, the court's decision in Griswold gave married couples the right to stop governmental intrusion into their most intimate areas of their life their sexual and procreative life. In 1972, in Eisenstadt versus Baird, the court applied the Griswold case to unmarried couples as well. Former medical student William Baird was arrested for handing out contraceptives to unmarried persons in violation of the Massachusetts state law. After Baird was convicted, he appealed his case to the Supreme Court, which struck down the law and overturned Baird's conviction. The court ruled that the right to privacy they described in Griswold wasn't just limited to married people. After all, a married couple is simply an association of two individuals and quote, if the right to privacy means anything, it is the right of the individual married or single to be free from unwanted governmental intrusion into matters so fundamentally affecting a person as a decision whether to bear or beget a child. The court also found that denying unmarried people the right to use contraception while allowing married people to do so would violate the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. It's important to note that the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment prevents the government from arbitrarily treating classes of people differently. It was argued that there was no legitimate reason to treat married and unmarried people differently for the purposes of contraception law. And in the context of the current abortion debate, many attorneys believe that the Equal Protection Clause is the strongest argument for the right to abortion because childbearing and laws that especially concern childbearing have a dramatically different effect on women compared to men. One year later in 1973, the court decided the famous case of Roe versus Wade, which struck down a Texas law that criminalized abortion. In that case, Jane Roe, which was a pseudonym, was an unmarried woman who was gang raped in Texas. When she found out that she was pregnant, she tried to get an abortion, but abortion was illegal in Texas except to save the life of the mother. She, as well as several other plaintiffs, including a physician, challenged the Texas law. They alleged it violated the zone of personal privacy protected by the 1st, 4th, 5th, 9th, and 14th Amendments. Following in the steps of Griswold versus Connecticut, the Supreme Court, in a 7-2 majority vote, held that the law was in fact unconstitutional. State laws banning abortion except to save the woman's life violated the due process clause of the 14th Amendment, which protected the right to privacy. The court held that the right to privacy includes a woman's qualified right to terminate her pregnancy. The court qualified his holding by finding that although the government cannot override the woman's right to terminate a pregnancy, it does have legitimate interests in protecting both pregnant women's health and the potentiality of human life. To balance the competing interests of the woman's life and the potential for human life, the court said that the right of the woman is the strongest during the first trimester and diminishes as the pregnancy continues through the second and third trimesters. Roe versus Wade made three key rulings. First, it held that a state could not outlaw abortion during the first trimester at all. Second, it said that the state could regulate abortion during the second trimester of the pregnancy, but only to protect a woman's health. And third, it ruled that the state could prohibit abortion during the third trimester, but not if the life or health of the mother was at risk. Roe also set the standard for reviewing future laws that implicated access to abortion. Roe states that courts must review such laws under, quote, strict scrutiny which is the highest level of judicial review. To pass strict scrutiny, the legislator has to pass a law to further a demonstrable, quote, compelling governmental interest. And it must have narrowly tailored that law to achieve that very compelling interest. This is a very, very high burden. In fact, this is the same standard that courts use when a law restricts the freedom of speech. This is also a very important lesson in constitutional law, because sometimes the most important decision in the Supreme Court's opinion is the mundane decision as to which standard to use. It's going to be much harder for laws to pass if you use strict scrutiny. Which brings us to the more recent case of Planned Parenthood versus Casey 
While Roe vs. Wade gets most of the popular attention, it's actually Casey that has been the number one target of anti-abortion activists. Those who opposed abortion did not go away after Roe vs. Wade. Instead, legislators used the state's power, which Roe explicitly approves of, to regulate abortion by creating laws that made it harder for women to get abortions. So the case of Planned Parenthood vs. Casey dealt with the state of Pennsylvania, which passed the Abortion Control Act of 1982, which had four regulations that restricted abortion. Spousal notification, parental consent when the woman was a minor, uh, the 24 hour waiting period, and a mandatory disclosure of certain information. In 1992, abortion advocates sued the state alleging that these new regulations violated Roe versus Wade. Now, before we talk about the outcome in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, First, a note about stare decisis. Stare decisis is a legal doctrine that theoretically obligates courts to follow historical decisions when ruling on a new case. This is also what's referred to as deferring to precedent. Courts are generally encouraged to follow their prior decisions or similar decisions of other courts in their geographical area. Since the Supreme Court is the highest court in America, all lower courts are bound by its decisions. But all decisions of the Supreme Court are co-equal to each other. So theoretically, there's nothing that stops the Supreme Court from changing its mind year after year. But the doctrine of stare decisis promotes continuity over time. It calls for judicial restraint, suggesting that future Supreme Courts to carefully craft ruling that respect precedent, even if they tweak the understanding of the law. So with the doctrine of stare decisis in mind, the court decided to make Roe versus Wade more workable rather than just overruling its central holding that women had the right to terminate a pregnancy. So in the Casey decision, the Supreme Court actually upheld all of the provisions in the Pennsylvania bill, except the one that forced a woman to notify her spouse in order to obtain a legal abortion. And at the same time, the five to four majority took this opportunity to rework the trimester framework of Roe. The opinion recognized that women do in fact have the right to terminate their pregnancy at certain times, but also overruled Roe's reliance on the trimester framework. Instead, the court emphasized that the key turning point in a pregnancy was when the fetus was viable, meaning able to live outside of the mother's womb. Medical advancements had meant that fetuses could survive as early as 24 weeks, rather than at 28 weeks, which had been the underpinning of the Roe versus Wade decision. As a result, the court drew a new line on the continuum, allowing for increased state interest when a fetus reaches viability. Before viability, the state can have some interest in fetal health, as long as it does not place an undue burden on the woman's right to an abortion. An undue burden in this context is one that has the quote, purpose or effect of placing a substantial obstacle in the path of a woman seeking an abortion of a non-viable fetus. After viability, the state can regulate and even outlaw abortion. Again, however, there is an exception. The states cannot outlaw abortion if it is necessary for the preservation of the life or health of the mother. The Supreme Court analyzed the four Pennsylvania restrictions at issue and found that only the one requiring the woman to notify the father was an undue burden. If women could only have an abortion after telling their sexual partner, it would give the man uh, substantial power over the woman's decision, which in some situations could even lead to a spousal or child abuse. At the same time, Casey held that states could make an effort to convince women not to have an abortion by doing everything from making the woman have an ultrasound to offer offering her mandatory counseling, but the state could not prohibit women from terminating a pregnancy. So the essential holding of Casey and the current law of the land is that states cannot ban abortion before 24 weeks and laws restricting abortion should be evaluated under the more lenient undue burden standard rather than a strict scrutiny analysis. So. Now what? The new breed of anti-abortion laws ignore the Casey framework about undue burdens, and instead, the laws simply deny the existence of a constitutional privacy right that allows women to make reproductive choices without governmental interference. The bill passed by Alabama's lawmakers, for example, contains language stating that abortion isn't a medical procedure, it's a genocide on par with crimes against humanity. The state's new law doesn't seek to throw women in jail, but instead it takes aim at the doctors. Despite the protections of Roe and Casey and the affirmation that there must be an exception in cases where the woman's life is in danger, Alabama carves out only a very narrow exception for the life of the mother if there is medical proof that the woman faces, quote, a serious risk of substantial physical impairment, 
uh, of a major bodily function. Would any doctor attempt to justify their medical judgment that an abortion is necessary when they could be convicted of a felony and face up to 99 years in prison? Meanwhile, in Georgia, lawmakers made a different determination. Their law allows women to be prosecuted for an abortion, whether it is performed by a doctor or self-induced. Women can get life imprisonment or even the death penalty. Georgia's law stops doctors from performing an abortion after they can detect cardiac activity, which happens around six weeks. However, many women aren't even aware that they are pregnant after just six weeks, which renders the law pretty close to a total ban on abortion, which directly violates Roe and Casey. Going even further, Georgia's law grants fetuses full personhood, even stating that they are to be included in the state's census. This legal personhood status is the basis for one of Georgia's most draconian regulations, the limit on a woman's right to leave the state to have an abortion. If a woman goes to a state where abortion was fully legal, the woman could could be prosecuted for conspiracy to murder, which carries a minimum 10 year sentence. If someone drives the woman out of state or otherwise helps her, they too could be charged with conspiracy to commit murder. Of course, these new laws are in direct conflict with constitutional precedent because they make abortion during the first 24 weeks of pregnancy completely illegal. The laws ignore the viability standard and instead pinpoint the detection of a fetal heartbeat as the time when the door to the abortion clinic must be slammed shut. They also ignore the Roe and Casey holdings that state they must make an exception for when the life or health of the mother is at stake. Instead, these laws come very close to outlawing abortion no matter what and no matter when. So what is the Supreme Court likely to do? Well, in recent years, circuit courts have carefully followed Casey and struck down laws placing an undue burden on the woman's reproductive choices. For example, several years ago, Idaho banned abortions at 20 weeks after fertilization. This directly violated Casey's 24-week viability rule. Idaho regulations also required all second trimester abortions to happen in hospitals and placed so many safety regulations on clinics that it made it nearly impossible for clinics to stay open. The legal regime made obtaining legal abortion a minefield for women like Jenny Lynn McCormick. McCormick was an Idaho resident who wanted to terminate her pregnancy, but she could not afford to travel to the closest abortion clinic in Salt Lake City, where she would have to pay $2,000 for the procedure. Taking up McCormick's case, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals found that Planned Parenthood versus Casey did not allow the state to criminalize the act of terminating a 20 week old pregnancy. The court also found that it was not medically necessary for abortions to take place at a hospital. As for the safety regulations, Idaho's clinic regulations included things like being properly staffed or making satisfactory arrangements with hospitals. These terms were so vague that they gave prosecutors the ability to make up their own definitions and then shut down the clinics. The Ninth Circuit followed in the footsteps of Casey and demonstrates the concept of stare decisis. However, the justices on the current Supreme Court have a very different view of stare decisis. Chief Justice Roberts, Justices Thomas's Alito and Gorsuch have been willing to overturn precedent when they disagree with it and have a majority. Even when they don't have a majority, these justices have often written opinions advocating for departure from long-standing legal precedents. The most recent significant overruling of prior precedent came in May of 2019 after Justice Kavanaugh joined the court. The conservative justices overturned a precedent which had stood for 50 years. The case involved the jurisdiction of where states could be sued. Justice Thomas wrote that the court could ignore principles of stare decisis when they believe that the prior ruling is erroneous. In a dissent in that case, Justice Breyer, who wrote the majority opinion in Casey, issued a warning about the willingness of his conservative colleagues to disregard precedent, stating, it is far more dangerous to overrule a decision only because five members of a later court came to agree with earlier dissenters on a difficult legal question. The majority has surrendered to the temptation to overrule Hall, even though it is a well-reasoned decision that has caused no serious practical problems in the four decades since we decided it. Today's decision can only cause one to wonder which cases the court will overrule next. In other words, Breyer is saying that today's conservative justices will sweep aside any rulings that they disagree with. On the other hand, there is no guarantee that the Supreme Court will hear a case that presents the opportunity to revisit Roe and Casey. The Supreme Court itself decides which cases it's going to take up and hear. There is no guarantee that any particular case will ever be decided in the Supreme Court. These new anti-abortion laws will definitely be struck down in lower courts, which must follow current Supreme Court precedent. 
but the Supreme Court only hears the cases that it wants to hear. This is a process called certiorari, or cert for short. For example, then Indiana Governor Mike Pence signed a law making it illegal for women to terminate pregnancy for various reasons. A federal appeals court blocked the law and Indiana appealed. The Supreme Court has now reviewed the case 14 times without deciding whether it would take it up or not. That is, without granting cert to hear the case. So there's no question that the anti-abortion laws that were passed in 2019 definitely do not pass constitutional muster. But that's only if we are following Roe and Casey. But the Supreme Court has changed in recent years, and many legal scholars believe that there could be enough votes on the court to throw out both Casey and Roe. The fact that the court has yet to decide whether to hear the Indiana case also indicates that it may be debating or revising its approach to abortion. So what will the justices decide when these cases inevitably reach the Supreme Court? We have no idea. There's no witty remark or pithy segue today. When I cover stories like these, it just makes me want to do some good for as many people as possible. If this video leaves you wanting to do some good in this world, I'd recommend Tab for a Cause, which lets you raise money for charity just by opening new tabs and browsing the internet, which you were probably gonna do anyway. Tab for a Cause is a Google Chrome extension that allows you to pick the charity of your choice, and then every time you open up a new tab, instead of a blank page, it displays a beautiful new customizable tab with a couple of tiny ads. The money that you generate is then donated to your charity. The gorgeous new tab is customizable with widgets, and my favorite, it shows you how much you are actually generating. Tab for a Cause users like you have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars, over $700,000 at the time of this video. It is the easiest possible way to donate to charity. So just click on the link in the description and download the extension, and do some good by doing what you were going to do anyway and open up a couple of internet browser tabs. So, do you think the current law is the way it should stay, or are you welcoming these new developments in the American South? Leave your objections in the comments below, and check out my other real law reviews over here where you can learn about the Mueller report and all kinds of timely legal issues. Just click on this playlist, and I'll see you in court.